Hi, so in this lecture, we're going to start uh, a discussion of uh, multiple expansion uh, the, of the charge distribution. Um, and the setting for the problem is as shown here. If you have some kind of um, localized charge distribution, which is characterized by a charge density function uh, rho, and uh, you try to measure the effects of these charge distribution from a point which is fairly far away from the charge source. So, um, so in a way, you're looking at the whole charge as if it's a point charge, but uh, this is not really a truly point charge, so there must be some details which differ um, from that of a truly point-like charge source. And uh, the, the aim of this lecture is to identify uh, ways to systematically develop those differences in some mathematical form. Uh, the starting point is actually uh, pretty simple. All you have to do is to try to evaluate this electrostatic potential, which is coming from this uh, charge source, which I wrote as rho here. And, um, and then you have uh, this measuring point at R, which is pretty far away from any of the source charges, which are localized over here. Um, and the question is whether there is a systematic way to evaluate the effects of these uh, localized but not truly point-like charge distribution. And the method has to be systematic so that once we have developed the technique, one should be able to apply the same technique to pretty much arbitrary uh, problem with any given charge distribution function rho or prime. So very naively, uh, the first guess would be that this whole thing will generate a potential which is like that of a single charge at a distance um, at a distance r from the from the origin. So we pretend that this whole charge is localized is localized at the origin, and the potential felt by the point over here is simply inversely proportional to the distance. And that will be uh, Coulomb's law. Uh, but the question is whether we can do a little bit better and try to go beyond this uh, most possible, most naive um, approximation. And the, the way to get started on this uh, systematic expansion is to realize that these, uh, this function r minus r prime uh, can be expanded in a pretty systematic manner by uh, applying the Taylor expansion. So we have these two kinds of objects. One is r and the other is r prime. And r, by definition, by assumption, is much, much bigger than r prime. So we take out this uh, dominant factor r in front like that, and that will be just 1 over r. However, there's all this other stuff which is still waiting to be handled in some ways. And you realize that these uh, both of these factors are basically uh, some high powers of r prime over r, which by our assumption is going to be a pretty small quantity. And, and this quantity I've shown here is second order in the small quantity. And uh, while this other thing here looks to be uh, first order in the small quantity of r prime over r. And uh, by, by simple application of the Taylor expansion, we arrive at these uh, various terms. And at first, they look uh, pretty messy. But after staring at these expressions for about two minutes, you can see that they can be organized. Uh, organized in powers of uh, r prime over r.
So this first factor here is, uh, as you can see, is basically just one power of r prime over r, while this uh, second factor carries uh, two powers of r prime over r. Okay, I mean, you can go on and, and consider higher and higher order tail expansions just for fun. Uh, however, uh, it's a good time for us to stop and try to think about the meaning of both this first expansion that we acquired and the second expansion we acquired over here. Um, and this general pr procedure is known as the multiple expansion uh, with this uh, first term playing the role of a dipole moment and its physical consequences and this uh, second term playing the role of a quadruple and its physical consequences. And obviously they can be higher order moments like octopole and so on. But in physics one rarely goes over, goes beyond the quadruple consideration. Um, so in fact it's, it's quite enough for us to stop here and just now start focusing on the consequences of these two extra terms acquired from the expansion. Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, the first term as we initially expected simply gives rise to the uh, monopole potential of charge Q. And you get this because this 1 over r is uh, independent of the integration variable r prime. So you can take this thing out first. And then what's left over is just the integral of, sorry, I should have said rho, not phi. It, what's left is just the integral of the charge density over the whole volume, which is nothing but the total charge contained within the localized source. So that's the simple part. And, uh, and now we go on to the non-trivial uh, first correction, so to speak. And uh, the first correction, which I labeled as the second term, because the first term is the monopole stuff. So whatever comes next should be labeled a second. So I call this phi2 to describe the potential coming from the um, the first order correction uh, to the potential. And since we're talking about this term and its effect on the potential, the correction to the potential uh, can be summed up in this, in this way. So R is some constant vector which can be taken outside the integral and the thing that has to be integrated over is this thing potential uh i keep i apologize for keep writing uh keep writing phi instead of the charge density which should be uh, really rho um so this is not a simple this is not only an integral of uh, potential uh, of the charge density but the charge density multiplied by the position vector of that charge density uh, then integrated over the whole volume. Okay, so uh, this integral is, uh, has a name. Uh, assuming that you, you perform this integral with success, you're going to be left with some sort of vector. And that, that, that vector will be called P uh, by convention and it's called the dipole moment. So dipole moment is some characteristic of this uh, charge distribution over here. So you can imagine that this uh, whole charge distribution is characterized by, first of all, its overall charge, and second of all, by its overall dipole moment, and third of all, by its overall quadruple moment, and so on. Okay, so, so with this uh, introduction of a new quantity called the dipole moment, the correction to the potential uh, is given this pretty uh, simple form. Uh, 
remember that this potential has to be a scalar. So the fact that you have a new vector quantity emerging, uh, such as p here, means that it has to be uh, taken an inner product with some other vector. And there's really no other vector to take an inner product with other than the position vector r itself. So r is, as I have mentioned earlier, is the position from uh, more or less the center of the charge distribution to the location where you're measuring the potential. And the inner product of these two vectors divided by the cube of the distance to the, uh, to the measurement point is what gives rise to the first correction to the potential. Um, so now let's move on to the next order correction coming from the so-called quadruple moment. Okay, so uh, by just inserting these, uh, this next order term, or next rather next next order term, into the potential form, you arrive at this uh, expression over here for the, uh, for the potential generated by the quadruple. And this integral is obviously uh, much more complicated than anything we have seen previously, certainly much more complicated than this one for the uh, dipole, dipole moment. But uh, you just have to take a couple of minutes to uh, stare at this expression and, and figure out a way to dissect this uh, complicated looking uh, integral expression. And eventually you come to the realization that you can define this uh, quantity over here called the quadruple tensor. So quadruple tensor has two indices, whereas the dipole, dipole moment vector is uh, only one index, x, y, z, because if r prime, uh, if the component of r prime is x, then you have a x component of the dipole moment, p, x, and so on. So p is a vector. However, uh, here we are now dealing with an object that carries a two indices, uh, it's two because uh, both R i and R j can be uh, x, uh, x and y and z. So altogether, there seems to be uh, nine different possibilities. And depending on which indices you pick, you have uh, potentially different results for the integral. And that's why this uh, resulting expression for Q has uh, two indices, Q i j. Okay, and we put this factor one half just for convenience. Okay, so this is some integral that one has to perform uh, given the charge distribution function rho of r prime. And we're going to just pretend that this integration has been performed somehow. Um, so that means we are left with this uh, whole bunch of numbers, basically, that characterize the properties of these uh, of this uh, charge cluster in some way okay so already we find uh, a charge overall charge Q and the dipole vector P which characterize this charge distribution profile and in, and in addition we have uh, another uh, bunch of numbers called the quadruple tensor that characterize the charge distribution profile in yet another sophisticated way. And using that information regarding the charge distribution profile, it's possible to write down the, the further correction to the potential, namely phi 3, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, pretty, well, I, I want to say simple, because, uh, again, I, I guess it's a matter of getting used to really uh, once you uh, spend enough time staring at this, uh, it doesn't look to be that horrible after all. Okay, so if you don't believe what I'm saying, then you might have to spend another 10 minutes or so just staring at this expression until your eyes feel more or less comfortable 
with this. Well, anyway, so this uh, this uh, phi three potential can be written in terms of the the product of qij with all these other things, and and we are assuming obviously the Einstein convention that the same indices i and j have to be summed over all three coordinates x, y, and z. Okay, so once you have this information for qij, then you also have the information for what the potential uh, profile would be like. And, and then the net potential would be just the sum of all these three things. The net potential would be phi1 plus phi2 plus phi3, with presumably the phi1 dominating over phi2 and phi2 dominating over phi3. Okay. But there might be cases where uh, the the net charge of the source is zero, uh, and therefore you don't even have phi one in the first place. In in that case, then the dominant effect would be coming from the dipole. Uh, and and there may also be situations where even this dipole moment is zero, then the dominant effect will be coming from the quadrupole. So although very weak, sometimes you might have to deal with situations where the supposedly stronger effects of the dipole or the charge are simply absent for some symmetry reason, and you have no other choice but to, but to somehow grapple with this uh, complicated potential and unravel its, uh, its mysteries and complexities. So as I mentioned, Physicists rarely go beyond the quadrupole consideration. So uh, the, the, the good news is that as far as the math goes, it's not going to get any worse than what I have done so far here. So hopefully you will practice these derivations enough to the point where you will start to feel comfortable with all these uh, tensors and, and summations. Okay, now uh, we have successfully derived the potential due to a dipole moment. Then the next step is to take the gradient of that dipole potential to work out the electric field as generated by such a dipole. And in theory, that's pretty simple because all you have to do is to work out the gradient of this uh, dipole thing. Uh, but this dipole expression is, as shown here, is uh, actually not that simple. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, you're being asked to somehow take the gradient. And uh, unless you're a total, uh, total guru on the vector differentiation, uh, this is not going to be uh, that trivial to do. And so I suggest that uh, we, we proceed by, uh, by component. That is, uh, instead of trying to work out this uh, vector derivative at once, we try to look at the component, uh, ith component of the gradient acting on this, uh, this dipole potential form where I have introduced the Einstein convention to uh, write down the dipole potential also using the component notation. Okay, then it's just a matter of applying the simple rules of differentiation. Uh, so this differential can work on the numerator or it can work on the denominator. Uh, that's not hard to do. And the result is this in terms of the component. Um, but now that you have worked this out in the component notation, you can actually restore the vector notation and, and convince yourself that the electric field arising as a consequence of a dipole moment is exactly of this form, where r hat is the unit vector pointing in the direction of the r displacement vector as, uh, as in here. Okay, so 
the electric field is still proportional to the dipole moment, which makes sense because dipole moment is really the source of the electric field now. Uh, however, the, there are a couple of differences from the ordinary Coulomb electric field. As you remember, the Coulomb field decays as the inverse square of the distance, but this thing here decays as the cube of the distance. Uh, so the decay is much faster than the Coulomb field decay. So it's obviously uh, apparently an, a weaker effect compared to the Coulomb force. And the other interesting thing about this is that the electric field is now angle dependent. So, so even the strength of the electric field is uh, angle dependent. Uh, remember the Coulomb field has um, same strength at the same distance regardless of where you're measuring the field strength. Uh, more like uh, which orientation, regardless of which orientation is being used to measure the field strength, you're going to measure the same field strength inversely proportional to the distance squared. But that's not the case with the dipole originating electric field. Uh, and to see that uh, in a more clear manner, it's best to actually take an explicit example of a dipole moment oriented along the x direction uh, and, and, and express this uh, unit vector in the cylindrical coordinate system as cosine theta and sine theta, then you, you realize that this uh, electric field has, uh, has a form written in this way. Okay, And so it has an x component and a y component which are proportional to these angle dependent functions. Okay, so obviously there's a pretty uh, there's a pretty complex angle dependence that requires some sort of sorting out. Um, but that's actually not that hard to do. Uh, what it says is that x component of the electric field is proportional to depends on the orientation angle theta in this manner. But using some simple trigonometric identity, you can convert that to this. Okay. And then the y component of the electric field due to the dipole uh, has the angle dependence as a sine of 2 theta. Now, one is, uh, one is cosine 2 theta and the other one is sine 2 theta apart from this uh, constant shift. So a clever way to express this, uh, this whole thing on a, on a diagram is to use the x-axis to represent uh, Ex minus 1 half. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly 1 half, but it's some 1 half times some, uh, some number, whatever number, to make the leftover pieces proportional to cosine 2 theta. But anyway, it's the x component, which is ex minus something, and the y component, y axis is ey. And when, when you plot these two, uh, two components uh, as a vector plot on this plane, then it's simply a, a unit vector that goes, goes around um, at, at twice the speed of the angle from the origin itself. So as you make a round of 360 degrees about, uh, about the x-axis, then the, this vector itself makes uh, 300 degrees times 2, which is 720 degrees turn uh, as you go around. So pictorially, the change in the electric field orientation will be uh, something like this. Okay. And then to recover the full picture, you simply impose a uniform electric field pointing in the plus x direction on top of this uh, rotating component, and that will be the uh, that will be the picture for the electric field generated by the electric dipole moment. Okay, and by assumption, I have assumed the case where the field uh, 
sorry, where the dipole moment is pointing along the uh, x direction, like here. And uh, so the, the lesson is that there is a component of the electric field which is uniform and pointing along the same direction as the as the as the dipole moment. And then there's a second component which kind of rotates around at twice the speed of the as the at twice the speed of the angle of rotation itself. Okay, so I hope that was uh, some guide or some help in in visualizing the electric field generated by a uh, dipole moment. Um, now, uh, okay, so the, the notion of multiple moment, as I have shown here, arises naturally if you think about the, the, the potential generated by a random but localized charge distribution and the effect can be systematically uh, expressed in terms of the potential due to a monopole uh, followed by the effect due to a dipole followed by the effect due to a quadruple and so on. Um, it turns out there's another quite interesting and intuitive way to understand where, how this concept of dipoles and so on has to arise. And, and this time, we're not going to think about the uh, potential generated by the charge distribution, but rather we're going to think about the force acting on such a charge cluster. And so the proposal is schematically shown here. We have some electric field distribution that happens to pass through this uh, charge object. And the question is, what exactly is the force due to this electric field acting on this uh, charge cluster? And the answer to that question obviously comes from evaluating uh, such an integral. Okay, because the local charge density multiplied by the local electric field will be the local force acting on the object. And the net force is nothing but the integral of all those, all those inferences over the uh, entire body of the charge. Um, here I have explicitly put the uh, position dependence of the electric field uh, with the intention of, of using the position dependence of the electric field. So what I mean is that I no longer have to consider the case where the electric field is uniform, but may well be thinking about cases where the electric field has some inhomogeneous component or space-dependent component. Now, uh, in that case, here's the approximation we can take. Now, this time, instead of... Uh, Instead of thinking about the, okay, uh, so this time, uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to pick some point, uh, some point which is localized, which is located inside this charge source. And we're going to call that point R. And by assumption, this object is pretty small in in terms of its size. So that means the electric field does not have to change that much as you go from one end of the sample to the other. Okay, so there's only a small and mild variation of the electric field across this uh, sample. And that means we can tell expand this electric field function uh, about some random point we have chosen as R. And R, as I mentioned, as I emphasized one more time, is uh, located somewhere inside this whole charge cluster. And it's not really necessary to specify exactly where R is located. 
as long as is assumed to be sufficiently uh, well inside the whole charge profile. Okay, so the Taylor expansion proceeds in the usual way. So the first expansion, first term in the expansion would be like this, and the second term in the expansion would be like that. Um, and then we systematically uh, look for the effect of this term in the force integral, uh, effect of this term in the force integral, effect of this term in the force integral, and so on. Okay, so we're going to start with the simplest one by just inserting this electric field to the leading order. And recall that this R is a constant and not a variable to be integrated over. So that means I can basically take this quantity outside the integral and just focus on the integral over the charge distribution function rho of R prime. Okay, and that will be nothing but the total charge. So the, the first order result is the total charge multiplied by the electric field uh, and some average location inside that body. However, the more interesting case, uh, again, this is, a, this is a kind of a trivial expectation, one that sounds obvious after all. Um, However, the more interesting situation is when the charge itself, when the object itself is charge neutral. And for a charge neutral object, you might think that the electric field will not be able to do anything because there's no net charge. Uh, however, that's not really the case. Uh, and it's not really the case, as you can see, uh, in this uh, second integral. Uh, which is uh, obtained by performing this uh, apparently horrible-looking integral. But actually, if you look closely, it's not that horrible because uh, uh, this uh, gradient is not the gradient on R prime, but it's a gradient on R. Uh, so what that means is that this gradient part can be taken outside the integral Okay, so after you realize that, then you see that the only thing to be integrated over is just this uh, R prime multiplied by the charge density at R prime. But lo and behold, this is just the dipole moment of that charge object. Okay, so the final result is pretty uh, simple. It's the P dot gradient operator acting on the electric field. Okay. And because there's a gradient a on acting on the electric field, this mechanism of generating force on, an, on a neutral object, on the charged neutral object, doesn't work if the field was completely uniform. So there has to be some inhomogeneity in the electric field. And if there were a, such an inhomogeneity, then the inhomogeneity of the electric field can couple to the inherent dipole moment of that object and produce some force, which will then presumably rotate the object or something, or do something. Okay, so this is another way that you can see how the concept of a dipole moment of a neutral object can arise in a pretty, pretty new, uh, pretty natural and uh, in a well, in a pretty natural and intuitive manner. Okay, thank you.